So hello and welcome to the Integrative Health Convention 2018 online interviews. Today we're going to find out more about Nikki Ellis, who is speaking at the convention this October about her unique osteopathic assessment of musculoskeletal conditions. The Integrative Health Convention is an annual convention in London featuring many leaders in their fields of complementary and conventional medical therapies to help people get better through these various healing practices. It's an opportunity for doctors, therapists, and the public to meet, share, learn from, and connect with each other. We believe that holistic health is um, essential and that people get better in more than one way. We believe that we all have so much to learn from each other and that the Integrative Health Convention provides a stage for this for therapists, for doctors, and the public. There are a limited number of tickets available which can be purchased at integrativehealthconvention.co.uk. This series of online interviews will help you get to know our speakers better who are leaders in their different fields of health, healing, therapy, or even medicine, and maybe help you decide which talk to attend out of the 36 talks to choose from over two days at the Integrative Health Convention 2018 at the Park Plaza, Victoria, in London. I'm your host, Dr. To Wong, and I've been a GP for the last 12 years in Devon, and I'm co-founder of Neurolinguistic Healthcare Limited, the organizers of the Integrative Health Convention. Neurolinguistic Healthcare provides courses in advanced communication skills and therapeutic techniques, as well as training in hypnosis for healthcare providers. Today, I'm speaking to one of our excellent speakers who's coming to the 2018 Integrative Health Convention at the Park Plaza in London on the 13th and 14th of October. And she's here to share with you what she knows and tell us a little bit about who she is and what she does, and what to expect from her talk at the convention. So this is Nikki Ellis, who's um, both an osteopath and a contemporary dance uh, um, teacher. And together with uh, Sudhir Daya, she runs Wellback Health. Uh, and Sudhir Daya is one, another one of our speakers, uh, who is a physiotherapist, and they are both located in central London. And they can, uh, Nikki can be found on her website at www.nikkiellis.org, and I'll put the contact details below. So, hi, Nikki. Hello. Good morning. Welcome. So, um, can you tell me a little bit more, uh, the audience, a little bit more about yourself? Maybe what I didn't cover. Um, well, yeah, I'm. A, I think you've already said I'm an osteopath, and I divide my week between essentially breaking people and fixing people. I think so. Um, I teach dance to I'm very privileged I work with a group of really fantastic young people that are being trained to potentially be elite level dancers so I spend a lot of time hurling them around a room and shrieking at them but then um, I also run a practice where lots of people come to be fixed hopefully none of them are the people in my classes but um, yeah I've so I balance my week between basically doing two different careers, but both of them informing each other, essentially. Um, yeah. And you do a unique uh, form of osteopathy um, or your osteopathy and, uh, and what you do. Can you tell us exactly what it involves? Um, I don't, I guess it, I don't know if it is unique in that other people probably are using similar skills, but basically um, what I've found over the years is if somebody's torn a ligament in their knee, they've torn a ligament in their knee. However, sometimes people are reporting knee pain and there's nothing that can be found in the knee, both from orthopedic testing or scanning. And then you need to start to look around at a body a little bit more globally in terms of, it's all obvious, looking at the foot, looking at the knee, at hip, and sometimes right up through into the thorax and neck. Um, and I've just developed a really simple system of looking for spring in bodies. So my belief is if you want to run, if you want to run a marathon or you want to swing from a trapeze or you want to do Pilates, whatever it is you choose to do exercise wise, you basically need the body to absorb force and recover from force. So if you decide to um, run and bounce off a wall, if that's your choice, you've got to be able to take that force into your body but then recover very quickly from it to then do another repeated activity. It's the same as running. You hit a hard surface, you rebound and recover. So I just shift through the body, through all the joints in the body, using what you're obviously going to expect to see from a near huge amount of range of motion compared to an SI joint. So it's about expectation from each joint and then figuring out how they all communicate. So 
So I liken it to my patients a bit like a bicycle um, in that sometimes you need, your bike isn't going very well. You need to put a little bit of air in the tires, but you might also need to oil the chain and you might need to raise the saddle a little bit. And that in itself will be enough to then be able to ride a bike easily. But if you only pump up the tires and don't do the other bits, you're still not gonna have a very easy cycle. And so people kind of understand that as a concept. But if it's a really big thing, like, I don't know, the gears are completely broken, I'm gonna to need to send that off to the shop and that may be me sending them to an orthopedic surgeon or a rheumatologist, because that's something I can't tweak and do. So yeah, that's sort of how people have expl I explain it. And it's about having flexibility and absorbing a body's ability to absorb. So you could just, uh, consider that strength if you wanted to. Cool. Yeah. So I'm always curious uh, what brings someone to be interested in their field, in health, in healing. Uh, can you tell me how you got interested in what you do and the story behind how you started doing what you do now? Um, so I went, uh, I went off to a ballet school when I was 11 years old. I got a scholarship, a bit like Billy Elliot, and went off to this uh, great big mansion and was like, oh my God, what's happening to me? Um, but I absolutely had the most wonderful time. And while I was there, a teacher noticed something in my back and I was trundled off to London to go and see a specialist physiotherapist in dance who said, you've got a scoliosis and if you keep dancing, you'll be in a wheelchair by the time you're 30. And um, so a sobbing, I think it was 16 or 17, went back to school sobbing and phoned my parents and said, I don't care if I'm paralyzed, I have to dance and made some great big drama. And um, I'm, as you can probably tell, a little older than 30 and I'm not in a wheelchair. So I, from that point, I started to become interested in the body and I'd always loved biology at school. I found it really fascinating and sort of in history, I'd learned the dates and it was interesting how we got to where we were in society. But when someone described to me how a heart worked, I was completely like, this is the most extraordinary thing. So all the way through dancing, one of my teachers at school was also interested in dance, medicine and health. So I used to make cups of tea at conferences and then go and stand in the conference and listen to all the medical speakers and therapists from around the world. It's called um, IAD and it's an International Association for Dance, Medicine and Science. And I also used to do things for Dance UK, which is now One Dance UK. Again, just handing out brochures, but listening. So I think, somewhere along the way I began to become interested and I, I, just without anybody pushing me down that road and then I went on to train at another college where they had an osteopath and I something about how the osteopath spoke to me really resonated and I really liked how they treated me and then again a few years later after I finished college and I was I was doing seven or nine jobs so I was dancing doing work for free, working in a bar, just struggling to basically run my dance career. And I found the 50 pounds or whatever it was that I needed to see the osteopath about my very sore knee. And he just said to me, I know your knee hurts, but you're not coping. And the fact that he acknowledged how I was feeling and was having such an enormous impact on my body was such a relief because I secretly, I knew it. I just didn't know that you could say it. I just had this feeling that all the time, if I was feeling struggling with stress or how I was existing, that my body was manifesting in strange ways and mechanically wasn't functioning when I danced how I wanted it to, but I knew I hadn't hurt myself. And I suppose that was the moment where uh, I became, uh, would I say hooked or just definitely sparked a greater interest for me. Mm. And then I continued dancing for several more years, about five or six more years. And at that point was going, I can't keep living off a dancer's wage. I need to do something else. Mm. And started to explore osteopathy and physiotherapy in different me mediums. And so I did a physics course and chemistry course in uh, an evening um, while I was still dancing and slowly put things into place. And then I jumped in and went to college, I think I was 29 when I started. And um, 
And then on graduation from osteopathy, went straight back into dance again, but this time as a teacher and only did a tiny bit of osteopathy. And then as the years, I think, I think as I was an older student, I knew how I wanted to practice. And I understand that the colleges have to get you to behave in a certain manner to pass exams, but I felt like I'd had a bit of who I was suppressed. So I just slowly worked in a few small clinics and found my style of treating and communicating with patients. And then just started to build up my own list. And one of the things that I, I think has been the most powerful for me is using that one moment where that osteopath gave me that opportunity to say, how are you? You don't seem like you're coping. And so many, and so many of my patients are relieved, I think, when I say, you don't seem okay. Is anything bothering you? How, how are you? Mm. And not just talking about a body part from a musculoskeletal perspective. Mm. So, um, yeah, now I, um, after graduating, I also started lecturing in an anatomy to dancers. Mm. And it's been great because loads of them are now training as physios and osteopaths. And one of, one of the things they often say to me is, I want to be able to know how, I want to be able to know how you are able to tell if someone's happy or not, or what's troubling them. Uh -huh. And they, they understand they can learn the mechanical aspects, but it's the process of asking, I suppose that intimate question, not intimate in a sexual way, just intimate in going, you seem a bit sad. Mm. Are you okay? And I'm not a counsellor, but it allows the beginning of a conversation. And for me to facilitate that person seeking appropriate help to go and talk to a counsellor or to go and see an orthopaedic surgeon if they've ruptured their ACL. So it's a dialogue that allows me to divert or uh, signpost people. So that's kind of my story from starting in dance and fight and always loving the body. And I guess working with my body every day mm -hmm. and wondering why this body in the room could do something and why another one couldn't. And, mm. and watching friends being injured and watching some of them recover and others not and why, why they were and why others weren't. And I guess the beast of psychology showing itself to me. Um, one of our other speakers, uh, like uh, saying um, Amanda Schill, who was talking about acupuncture, she started out uh, as a professional dancer as well, actually. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, how, how dancing has to do with the body and uh, and it eventually leads you to work with the body. Yeah, and so much of, of obviously, uh, not many jobs have people touching each other all day. And in a dance studio, people grab you in some quite intimate places sometimes to make sure you don't fall flat on your face. Oh, um, nice. And so, you know, if you think of like a classic ballerina pose with the boy with the girl mm -hmm. over their head, the hand is in quite an intimate place and the girl will be quite happy about that because she doesn't want to fall t two meters to the floor. So people oh, are, you're used to handling bodies and seeing the robustness of them really. It always mm. amazes me how robust human bodies are. And when you read things like, is it the femur won't, the femur's stronger than a piece of concrete. Concrete will break before a femur breaks. I think mm. I read once because it's mm. able to absorb stresses. And what a great mm. sort of kit we've been given mm. and making sure that stays, trying to keep that optimal through the fuel mm. we put in it and how we think and look after it. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, and in October at the Park Plaza, um, you're going to talk about your unique uh, osteopathic assessment mm -hmm. of musculoskeletal conditions. Can you tell us a bit more about this topic that you're going to talk about and what the audience will gain out of it? Well, what I hope to do, I'm afraid you won't be getting any PowerPoint from me because I don't, I'm a technophobe. Mm -hmm. um, most of what you'll be doing is practical and some really hilarious drawings on a whiteboard that I remember I tried to use technology and some students said, please, can you stop? Because your pictures are so funny. We always remember what you drew. Uh -huh. So uh, basically what I hope to do is just give you a few ideas of how very quickly to look in different places of the body. So I guess if I give an example of a patient, um, 
and then explain it, it might be helpful to you. So I had a patient come in, um, in fact, she takes my dance class and that she, I kept noticing she didn't jump. And I said, why don't you jump? She should have had an ankle injury for years. And I don't like to mix business. Uh, so I just, one day I said, well, I, I can look at it, but it's up to you. And she said, no, go on then. But no one can find anything. And her story was she'd been her, a hurdler. She'd gone into a, hurdled into uh, practicing, gone into a sand pit and gone down on her ankle, loads of pain, couldn't walk. Um, and she had had two arthroscopies and nobody could find anything wrong with her ankle. But now she couldn't really walk around the shops anymore. And she'd taken to doing aerial circus skills because she could use her upper body, and not have her foot on the floor. Mm. Um, so I looked at her ankle and I mean, it was a bit stiff and sticky and, but then I went, your fibula doesn't move. And I just moved up one fibula lateral malleolus and superior fibula head. I started to just move her fibula head and suddenly her foot pain started to decrease. And what amazed me and depressed me is that the lateral malleolus is part of a bone that goes up to your knee and nobody had ever looked at the other end of the same bone. And I started to just do a little bit of movement with it and she went, I've been walking around the shops and mm. then I started moving up to her hip. And when I said to her, when you went down into the sand pit and you said you, she said she'd sprained her ankle. Did you ever have any bruising? Did your foot go a nice spectacular rainbow color? And she said, no, I sprained my other ankle. It did that. And I said, I don't think you sprained your ankle. And suddenly there was a silence and I've got, she'd been, had two arthroscopies. And nobody had asked her if her foot had ever swollen or gone black and blue. And it was very simple questions and then very simple, tiny bits of spring. And all I was doing was going, I don't expect a fibula head to be swinging like a windscreen wiper, but I do need to give in the joint. And just that started to create a whole chain of events. Um, and then we started because of how she'd been walking and moved up into the hip and the pelvis work through that and then I'm not a rehabilitation specialist but I said you can now walk pain-free and she said well I'd like to run again and I said well I I'm going to send you to physiotherapist because I share my practice with a physio and I think what we've both worked towards is not being a jack of all trades and a master of none is I'm just really good at this little bit and now I need to pass you to the next person and they can do that really well that's not to say I can't do rehab I can I just don't develop my interest in such a way that my interest is in as as the physio said you do braille you read braille you read the tiny bits of a body that are out of line so i like i think i said to in the a summary of what i do i think the body's like an orchestra and what you're doing is you're looking for in the strings you can hear that there's a bum note and you have to search through which violin it is that's making the bum note and then you've got to retune everybody to meet that. So for me, the violins would be bones, the brass could be fascia, the wind can be the muscular system. And it's about getting all of them to balance and create a unified sound together. And that's all I do. And it is very simple. I do it's just a little bit of bounce and spring and looking for what I call speed bumps. So I move something and I expect it to move I expect a hip, a hip to move like a pestle in water. So I'm stirring it round and suddenly you hit a divot or a, a little jolt. And then you start having a look at that. And I've had incidences where scans have said there's nothing damaged. But I've been absolutely convinced there is. And when the surgeon, and, and I, I'm not a big advocate of surgery, I always try not to go there for patients. But some have had to go there. And when they've gone in, they've had huge label tears that, haven't shown up on the scan and it was just from a very simple a, a, a texture and you can only learn that I think through just holding lots of joints and just having a move of them and you're not going to harm anyone people do way worse than themselves walking down the street and tripping on pavement slab picking up a shopping trolley uh, sorry shopping basket so that's really simply what I do and I'll just share how I quickly and it is a very quick process of how I shift through the body. And as you move a joint, and this is only my belief system, when I move, uh, so if I move a vertebrae, 
you'll watch the rest of the body vibrate. And then if you move up a vertebrae, suddenly it doesn't move very well and the rest of the body stops moving. And I always say that's your, you've got a roadblock. You've got 26 bones that have got the capacity to move in the spine. If three or four of those don't move, you've now got essentially an office where three people have gone up off sick and everybody else starts to take the work. And so it's so simple the way I assess. Obviously, you've ruled out any red flags and used your orthopedic tests. If you've got a raging disc, I'm not going to start doing some of the things that I'm doing. Or if I've got a great big red hot swollen knee, I'm not going to start doing any of these things because I know that's not something I can deal with at that point. Mm -hmm. So my yeah. medical knowledge does assist me, but once... I feel like I've ruled out those anything really imminent danger, then I can start to assess for the what we call weird and wonderfuls. Well, that's why all the uh, training is so essential, isn't it? To to uh, make sure that you don't continue treating red flags and uh, move them on. And, it's, uh, and like you said, there's nothing wrong with having your own little interest and being happy with that, mm -hmm. being really good at something and then mm -hmm. recognize maybe someone else is better at something else. Yeah, and, and for me, it's, uh, and Sadir, what, who I work with, we've, I guess we're cherry picking a team and that doesn't mean we only have one, for instance, if we send, once people have stopped working with us, we send, they want to get back to activity, we might have someone wants personal training, we don't have one, we might have three because everybody's got different personalities and responds to different people and mm -hmm. I think the greatest magic is that first meeting where you connect with your patient and make them feel safe mm. and if you can get that and you can make that sort of it's almost like in a weird way it's like speed dating where you're going i like you i want to talk to you more i'm going to tell you more things or mm. you sit back and you don't and um so a lot of people we do we, we very carefully cherry pick and so we try and match people because if you go and work with someone that you don't like that's really demotivating and then essentially fall out the loop of health mm -hmm. so yeah we're just building that network brilliant having thought about the integrative health convention where the audience will be made of doctors therapists and the public where do you see your particular practice fitting in with integrative health or holistic health um i think that i'd like to try and dispel the myth of we're all bone crunchers um okay. there's many many particularly in the um conventional medicine lots of gps lots of patients say their gps say or oh, don't see an osteopath they just crunch your bones and give people a stroke um kind of cracking their necks and i um whilst i know there's people that behave like that i also know for every medical field there's gps that oversubscribe uh, over over prescribe medication and poison their patients and misdiagnosis there's always good and bad people in all practices and um, so i'd like to dispel some of the myths that we all are bone crunchers there's a whole host of people out there working in different ways um, i'd also like to let all the other complementary therapists know how different osteopaths work because we have in osteopathy quite well known as cranial osteopathy which some people use and some people think is voodoo hoodoo and other people swear by it and it's to basically open a dialogue, really, of discussion. So uh, often I feel people stand in their corner trying to fight their corner. I've got no corner to fight. The only corner, I, the only thing I want to fight for is getting people better. And if that's seeing a, a psychic healer or that's seeing a homeopath or that's seeing a surgeon, whatever journey someone makes, it's about getting them back to health, getting them back to living. Again, living a life that they're happy with. Mm -hmm. in, com in relative comfort so that's really all i hope to do and i'm always curious to hear how other people think and operate and i think as we had a conversation before we went online a lot mm -hmm. of people are thinking the same thing and doing the same things we just describe mm -hmm. them in different ways mm -hmm. and if that resonates how you describe it if that resonates for a person then that will help yeah, absolutely and i think that's the last thing. one thank you I'm asking one last question. Uh, so as a therapist or teacher uh, with years of experience, what do you think in particular is the key to health and healing in what you do? 
something personal maybe that or about what you do that you think makes the most difference listening and asking not being afraid to ask difficult questions so um if uh most people if it always horrifies and saddens me how many people self-harm mm. and i'm in a i guess i would is the word privilege right word i am in a position where when people take their clothes off and dress down to their underwear i can see mm -hmm. the self-harm cuts and i've had many conversations about this where some therapists say oh I, i don't know what to say i don't know how to ask and i said then you may be i if i ask i could be the person that helps facilitate and getting the help they need mm. uh, so sometimes i have to ask really difficult questions i've asked questions about Do you have an eating disorder? Are you binging? Things that um, horrify people. And then they'll burst into tears and say, you're the first person I've ever told I've been bulimic for 25 years. And then mm. I can say, would you like me to, to show you, offer you some avenues for support? I can't, I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make it drink. Mm. But sometimes when you're so lost and so broken, you can't even know how to start helping yourself and mm. so i feel that's a great privilege in the position of my work and i think those are my keys is to listen and not to be afraid to ask really difficult questions people can always say they don't want to answer the question mm. no one ever asks you mm. you can be really alone and stranded mm. and i think there's a great relief for many people when somebody says i do this and go, okay Let's get mm. you some help. And right. I think the, the most powerful thing for me and, and the, the saddest thing for me is I'm, we're all healthcare professionals. I feel there's a men, many, many people dealing with health, but I feel very strongly that the care gets lost. Mm. And I'm always interested in people who offer care mm. alongside the health. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And it's so important to have that time to be able to do it as well. It's a luxury. I, I'm very aware that I have a lot of time that I can offer to that. Um, and I know that in different mediums, people don't have that. But sometimes taking just a few moments, a few extra minutes out of your day, I'd love to always finish work on time, but I don't. <laughs> Because sometimes something will reveal itself and I can't ask. Mm -hmm. I think, I think every single one of us who treats patients can relate to that. <laughs> It makes me how people run to time. I'm like, oh my goodness, how do they do yeah, that? I, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> start on time, but never finish on time. Mm -hmm. right, so yeah, that's what I think. Thoughts. Good, thank you. So uh, thank you, Nikki. Thanks, thanks a lot for your time. And thank you all to the audience for uh, watching and listening to this one. Uh, so remember to get your tickets early now from our website by following the links below. We are the Integrated Health Convention in London on the 13th and 14th of October 2018 at the Park Plaza, Victoria. You can use the discount code PODCAST10, which will give you a 10% discount as a gift from us to you for sharing your time with us today. I wish I could attend all these 36 different talks. You know, you can see uh, Nikki's going to give us a wonderful talk. Uh, be great to see you there when we see you in october in london you get to meet myself nikki and all our other amazing speakers there thank you very much thanks thanks nikki thank you bye-bye